Hey wonderful growth group people, it's the third in our series Impossible Commands and today we're thinking about rejoicing in the Lord always. Now I'm not sure where your heart is but in the fourth term and we're a couple of weeks now into the fourth term as we head towards the end of the year we really do tend to start feeling a little tired, a little worn out, our patience levels get tested, seriously tested and our fuses are short. Add to that we've just got the normal pressures of life right, we've got work stress, you know, end of year deadlines perhaps, struggling relationships, worries about money or health, uh, these things can easily rob us of joy and cause us to despair. And so when we get a commandment like we do from Paul in Philippians chapter 4 to rejoice, it can, it can seem downright impossible. And it's not just Paul, there are numerous places where we are instructed to be joyful. Just to give you one example, in Leviticus 23, God's people Israel are told to go and get uh, tree branches uh, for one of the annual festivals and to rejoice in the Lord, to wave these branches around and to rejoice in the Lord for seven days. So as we read the Bible, we see that God is all about joy. He really is. It was even built into Israel's laws and feasts. It's almost as if God knows that people will tend towards joylessness. And so over and over again, we are told to rejoice, to rejoice in song, Psalm 33, to be joyful in hope, Romans 5, and even in hard circumstances, the Bible calls us to rejoice. So have a look at James chapter 1 and verse 2. James says, Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. In light of this verse, we really do need to stop and think about what joy is. You know, when we, when we think of joy, we often equate it with, with feelings, with, uh, with a mood or an emotion. And we feel joy when we've experienced something nice. It's a, it's a byproduct of a good time. But it means then that we only have it when life is good. And then when life is bad, we tend to despair. But biblical joy is not something we first and foremost feel. It, it doesn't exclude our feelings, much like we saw with love last week. But it's not an emotion that we have to try and conjure up or manufacture. Biblical joy is an action. It's an act of obedience. God's people are not told to feel joy, but commanded to sing joyfully. It's a, it's a radical redefinition. And the order is important because our joy is not connected to life's ever-shifting circumstances, which are up and down and always changing. That's why James can write the way he did, that these Christians can rejoice in their afflictions. Why is it? Well, let's keep reading. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. James is saying here that their present difficulty is helping them endure. Their faith is tested and is maturing them as they place their hope and place their trust in their unchanging God. We rejoice in the Lord, says Paul, N not in health or, or money or success, because those things are fleeting. They can be taken away from us in an instant. We rejoice in the Lord. And we see this worked out very clearly in the life of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 says that we need to keep running the race of faith with endurance, to keep our eyes on Jesus who has run this race before us. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus could rejoice even in the worst circumstances as he walked the road to the cross, because through God's good plan, he would bring restoration and forgiveness to the world. Jesus' joy was not connected to his present suffering. It was found in delighting in the God who rescues people, a God who calls people to himself, who forgives people, and who promises them a glorious future. And because it's an act of obedience, joy is not an optional extra. You know, some Christians are joyful and some are not, as if it relies on personalities, you know, some are bubbly and some are more serious. No, within all of our personalities, we are commanded to rejoice, 
Jesus wants his disciples to be joyful. To pursue joy is not a selfish thing. It is to pursue what he died for. He died and he rose again so that we might know the deepest and richest joy imaginable. To have an eternal hope amidst the brokenness of the world around us. You know, we often make the mistake of thinking that sin will bring us joy and that God will spoil our joy. It's an enormous lie. Jesus went to the cross to die because we have pursued joy in the wrong places. But now in him, we discover the joy for which we were created, a relationship with our eternal God and Father. And so rejoice. Where do we start? Well, remember our series. We can't do this on our own. God has to help us by the power of his spirit. And so ask him to give you joy. Say sorry for looking for joy in all the wrong places and then look up and obey him. Set your hearts and minds on things above where Christ is seated. Delight in him. Rejoice. Two quick things to mention before you get to some group discussion and study. Firstly, rejoicing doesn't mean we ignore the circumstances we're in. It's not chin up, grin and bear it and smile through the very real pains of life. No, we can grieve. Jesus wept at the death of his friend. We mourn with those who mourn. We will go through bitter and hard times, but even in those times, there can still be joy in our hearts, even if it is just a faint glimmer, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is constant. He loves me. He has made me his. He has forgiven me. He, he says he'll never leave me or forsake me. He is leading me to glory. He'll transform this lowly body to, to be like his glorious body. There is so much to rejoice in the Lord. And especially in hard times, we need to press in him so that like uh, these Christians who James is writing to might endure and they might endure patiently. And then secondly, this is something to be pursued. How? Well, root yourselves deeply in the word of God. How can you rejoice in the Lord if you don't know him? You want to explore his works. You want to explore his promises. Because when you get up tomorrow and you don't feel like rejoicing with all the stress of work, you'll be reminded that you can rejoice in the Lord who is in control of all things. The weight of the world is not on your shoulders, but on the one who created it all. When you are mocked for your beliefs, you can rejoice in the Lord that you get to be a light. You get to be a beacon of hope, even though you feel like there's a target on your back. And that you have the incredible privilege of walking the very footsteps Jesus walked. When you suffer with sickness and just the brokenness of this world, you can rejoice in the Lord that he will he'll never let you go. And that death can strip you of this body. But Jesus will resurrect you again. When money is tight, you can rejoice in the Lord who is your provider. When relationships are hard, you can rejoice in the Lord because he has forgiven us. And so we can forgive each other. We can say sorry when we make mistakes and we can love those who hurt us. Rejoice in the Lord always. Christchurch Cascades. Thank you.